Good, good afternoon, education leaders. Uh, I'm really grateful that you attend this very last session of the second day. And your presence really gives me a lot of encouragement. I guess all of you should be very tired by now. So I don't know what I'm going to share, but except that I can say I'm going to give you some dim sum uh, for the afternoon. <laughs> a bit of introduction of myself. Uh, before I move on, because I'm going to say something quite different today. I have discussed with Asha and Peter uh, uh, in, in quite a detailed way uh, about what should I contribute to this conference. They say, you are from Asia. We want you to talk about Asia. Uh, because a lot of countries are actually quite interested in Asia, especially recently in the PISA outcomes, Asian countries seem to be doing quite well. And so I'm going to talk about Asia. And I'm going to talk about the shifting learning agenda in Asia. And I'm going to talk about it from an insider and outsider perspective, because I am one of the few lucky ones in the world uh, who had an opportunity to work in Australia. I had uh, uh, worked in University of Sydney for two years. Actually, I meant to come for good, uh, but suddenly I was called back to Hong Kong because of something very urgent. I can tell you the story when I am off stage. But then as soon as I went back to Hong Kong, Singapore approached me. So I'm not working in Singapore. Uh, my background is comparative education. I'm, I feel very lucky. I'm not only studying comparative ed education, but I'm living and working comparatively in different cultures. So I would look at Asia also from the perspective of from outside of Asia. And hopefully, that would provide a context for dialogue. I want to say, actually, a lot of things are driving Asia to change. What's happening in the world actually has given a lot of pressure for Asia to change. Uh, the Western world is leading the agenda. Asia always feels we are following the Western agenda, or the, but we don't call it Western agenda. Perhaps we call it international agenda. So Asia always follow but following at the same time doing very well. Within Asia, there is a lot of discussion, a lot of talks, a lot of concern that the world is changing and we must change. One very interesting concept is knowledge economy and lifelong learning. And lifelong learning is becoming so important in nation in Asia that in many Asian countries, it is legislated that the country has, according to law, has to provide lifelong learning. But what is lifelong learning in, Asia, in, in the Western country, especially Europe? Lifelong learning came about because of knowledge economy. Because the industrial stage has already moved on to the knowledge stage, and job changes, future uncertain, changes becoming very rapid. And people, therefore, need lifelong learning to continuously equip themselves in order to survive, find new jobs, present themselves, using informal op opportunities to formalize their learning and present, them, uh, to, uh, present themselves to the new employers. They know the new job. They know the new field. They are trying to present their, themselves in the best possible way. But the situation is very different in Asia. We cannot say. Asian economy is knowledge economy. But Asia is the most creative region in adopting international agenda. In Europe, it is because of the knowledge economy that developed the concept of lifelong learning. But in Asia, they feel we are not yet knowledge economy, therefore we need lifelong learning to develop knowledge economy. The agenda is reversed. The terminology is the same, and the outcome seems to be converging. That's very interesting. I don't know whether you think Asia is creative or not. The Asians complain that we are not creative. But for me, Asia is very creative. Because when they adopt 
lifelong learning, China would say Confucius is the greatest example of lifelong learner. He learns for, throughout the rest of his life. Civil service examination, there's no entry requirement. You, anyone can take the exam, the national exam, the civil service exam, wherever you come from, whatever stage of schooling you, you have taken, only, you, can, you only need to prove yourself by scoring number one, then you become number one scholar, you become qualified to, to, to be appointed top official, and you will become even qualified to marry the princess if you, if you are a male. <laughs> Digital revolution, Asia is very aggressive too. Uh, this morning Richard said he used his Samsung uh, rather than Apple. I don't need to elaborate on that. Uh, <laughs> But for 21st century skill, there are two major agenda, especially in Singapore, ex very clearly expressed in Singapore. When we are moving towards 21st century skill, we want our next generation to be self-directed. Self-directed learning, they have to be having their inner drive. And they also need to be collaborative. And collaborative learning or collective learning is very much an Asian value. So no Asian find it difficult. And it is a requirement, it is a must, it is a reflection of Asian culture. Then, and all these two directions actually merge very well with 21st century's competence. And the 21st century competence has really affected uh, the re reform agenda in many Asian countries. For example, today I just try to highlight Shanghai, Shanghai, Shanghai was mentioned this morning. I was very worried. Uh, Richard, you mentioned Singapore. Luckily, you didn't mention Singapore, so I can talk about Singapore this afternoon. <laughs> Shanghai. Shanghai actually has done two very great things. At a time when student population declined, they did not close the school. Because they projected five years later, the population will come up again. Instead of firing the teachers and closing down schools, they do professional development for teachers. And that sustained the teaching force for a growing population later on. The second thing the Shanghai government did really boldly was sending uh, principals and teachers of top schools to bottom schools. They say, the government said, if you are really, really good, you should not only excel in top school, you should prove yourself in bottom school. And you should know, if you are teachers at principal, you should know how difficult this is. Because in top school, perhaps you don't need to do anything. Whether you teach or not, students excel. Uh, sometimes uh, teaching in top school, it is a, a, a lot of pressure. Because when I walk into the classroom, before I say anything, students already know what I'm going to teach. But for bottom school, no matter how hard you teach, students don't understand. And so, one miracle, one major job that uh, the, the municipal government of Shanghai did was to merge them, make them sister school, or change the personnel, or team them up so that they can learn the experience. Hong Kong, Hong Kong is on the news every day. Hong Kong is very innovative and bold in reforming the curriculum. Hong Kong is the one of the faithful learners of Australia. Australia created the concept of key learning areas. I don't know whether Australia is adopting it, but Hong Kong is adopting it. Adopting it to an utmost extent to create a new subject, a new compulsory subject called liberal studies. Is it successful? Are Hong Kong students liberal? Yes, <laughs> just a few years. The Hong Kong students are so liberal they occupy the central, uh, central government building. <laughs> So Hong Kong education, very successful. <laughs> Japan's creativity, I don't need to, uh, to elaborate, but Japan always feel they are insular because they are an island, so they want to internationalize their people, and they feel they are too much of passing on the tradition. They, creativity has a very strong agenda. And Singapore. Since 1997, there's a report called Singapore 21, and that report in 1997 actually decided to make Singapore a 21st century country. 
a country of globalization, a country with, that would play uh, a strong role in the international world.